Hi, everybody. Welcome to this webinar, Improve Your Nonprofit User Experience. This is so much needed because we need to learn how the user experience from our website can help with the success of our organization, right? Help them engage with our nonprofit audience. My name is Aretha Simons. I'm the webinar producer here at TechSoup. Before we get started, I'm going to go over a few housekeeping for you. Um, please type your question in the Q&A. We're going to see the recording with the slides within 48 hours. Um, if you have a question, please use the closed caption if you're unable to hear. But I was going to say, if you have a question, you can put it in the chat or the Q&A, and we'll be um, sending you out everything when I said the next 48 hours. Yeah, as soon as the recording is available. So what I'm going to do is turn this over to Kyle and Joe so they can both co-founders of TAP Network, and they can go ahead with the show. Have a great webinar, guys. Hi, welcome everybody. Good morning, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Joe DiGiovanni. I'm one of the co-founders of TAP Network, and I'm with Kyle Barkins, my uh, fellow co-founder. Kyle and I have been working with TechSoup for over 10 years. We own a, a digital marketing agency, TAP, which uh, serves nonprofits and, and government agencies. So we're super excited to get started today. I'll uh, give you just a little quick background on TAP and the history and why we're here. And Essentially, our backgrounds were working with uh, in, in the B2B, B2C space with Fortune 100, 500 organizations. And we really got excited when we met with TechSoup of how can we port all that knowledge and technology to the nonprofit space. And if you would have spoken to us a few years ago, you would need an entire team to do what we're talking about today. But with technology and AI and a lot of automation, nonprofits with just one executive director there are just one or two folks on staff can do so much more um, by engaging their audience and, and really you know, improving that user experience at, at every touch point. So uh, today we're gonna go through, we'll go through the agenda. We're gonna talk about user experience, uh, the core values of user experience, how it's important to your organization, and really focus on the features of a user optimized website. Everything from site architecture to user flows, responsive to design, mobile optimization, typography, iconography, color. Look at all these different pieces that really may uh, come together. So yeah, so we'll get started. And we want to start out with a poll question. So how successful is your website's user experience? If you can go into the chat box and you know, just give us your answer, A, B, C, or D. And if you have any questions around uh, these, please take note and at the end of the, uh, the presentation, we'll address specific questions. So here, here they, this looks like my grades from, from college, B, C minus, D, yep, that's it. Uh, Awesome. Well, that, that gives us a good sample size. I think, you know, the website user experience, it seems is good danger zone from, from everybody. I guess if it was excellent, um, you wouldn't be here. But uh, yeah, our goal is, is to get you to move up the chain of uh, command here so you have a great experience. So let's, let's kick this off. Um, what is user experience? It's really how people feel when they're navigating your website and they're engaging with your nonprofit. And in today's world, everything ultimately touches your website, whether they're on people are on social media, they're reading a blog, they attend an event, register for, for an event. It all comes back to the website and it's on the front end, how you're engaging them. And then the tools and technology on the back end to personalize that experience. And then you have UI, which refers to the screen, the buttons, the toggles, and icons. So we'll go through all that today. And why does it matter? Well, it really helps differentiate your, your organization. You're, you're competing not just with other nonprofits, but other folks in your space. If you're a diabetes organization, you're competing with the pharmaceutical companies who have you know, billions of dollars who are also going after the same audience with, with, with their medications. You're, you're competing with everything else out there, TikTok. So everything that you can do from a user experience is going to give you a, a competitive edge. And at the end of the day, at every touch point of your user experience, what you wanna look at is the conversion rate. So if you're trying to get folks to donate, to become members, to become volunteers, 
that user experience, if you can improve that user experience, improve that conversion rate at each touch point, ultimately you can double, triple your ROI return on investment uh, for your organization. So we'll talk about the key elements of a user optimized nonprofit website. Scalability and flexibility, user flow, and then we'll discuss responsive web design. And I'll turn it over to Kyle um, for this section. Awesome, thanks, Joe. Yeah, as you said, we're gonna we're gonna highlight a few uh, the, the the key areas today. So scalability and flexibility, uh, user flow, and then we'll talk about responsive um, and mobile web design. Uh, we all we get started though with scalability and flexibility. So this is the ability. Like when we think about this over time, it's how do we start with something um, or rebuild something that we that can grow with our organization, grow with our needs, um, and grow with our team over time. And to do that, we start. We look at two two things primarily. We start. We look at the CMS, the content management systems. This is where you build your site. This is the platform you build it on. Uh, and then we look at the site architecture. So that's how you build your site or how you structure the the information. Uh, we'll go through that today. Uh, first, we, we want to pick out a, a content management system that fits our needs and we know it can grow and scale with us. Um, there's we basically break this down into two types. Uh, there's managed CMSs, so managed content management systems. Those are things that uh, you know are hosted somewhere else for you. You're kind of lim I'll say limited to um, what you're able to do with them based on the tools that are available in those platforms. Some common examples of those would be like Wix and Squarespace, um, which you probably see pretty pretty frequently. Um, and then there's the open source CMSs. Those are the ones that you've got a little bit more flexibility with, but it's kind of what you build from it, right? So uh, some examples of those you probably hear pretty frequently are WordPress, Drupal, uh, and Joomla. And today's conversation is going to focus a little bit more on the WordPress side of things. It's, it's, it's our recommended platform when you're going the open source route. It's also used by about 45 to even 50% of all websites on the web right now. So it's very widely supported, very flexible and scalable. Uh, we'll kick this off though with a quick poll question. Uh, if you can answer this in the, in the chat, um, what, what CMS does your nonprofit use currently? Is it Wix, uh, Squarespace, WordPress, or uh, other, maybe you don't have a website? These are rolling in now. So it looks like it's a pretty good mix here. I saw Weebly pop up in there. Uh, I saw some Joomla pop up in there, uh, some Wix, uh, and then a good chunk of you actually are on WordPress today. So a lot of this, you know, we, we might talk through might be relevant to you, um, but we'll, 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 we'll go through, you know, planning the right, the right approach from, from there. And then the second piece is the site architecture. So good site architecture is really how, how the, the information is laid out um, from the, the top down. So what's the structure look like uh, when someone's navigating the site? So thinking site maps, um, thinking navigation structure, uh, thinking even down to the URL, so what appears in the browser bar. Uh, and then it's, and it goes further into how pages are laid out and how common pages are laid out. And what we're doing in this user, in the overall user experience is we're trying to make it so users get familiar with how your site's laid out. They get you know, used to how, the, how to use that site. And we take cues from other sites across the web, best practices across the web. So if you think of sites like, I mean, Amazon's a great example. Um, they've got that buy now button, you know, so you can just click one time and, and get right where you're going. You can check out without having to go through all those different steps. Uh, that's great user experience and users of Amazon have been conditioned to use it that way. And you'll see that same user experience used across other sites. But that really comes down to site architecture, how they've laid that out, how they've made that user experience and that user interface all work cohesively together to get you there pretty quickly. Um, so we're going to talk about you know, the ease of navigation and then creating that site map that's, that's the blueprint of your website so you can see how that's crawled by you know, search engines and how that's uh, used by, by individuals and visitors. Um, when we talk about site art, when we talk through specifically site architecture, we want to think about this in, in often a few different layers. So we have this top layer, which is kind of like the, the, high, the well, this is a hierarchy, but the top layer is, is you know, first level. So this is where you typically drive people at the, the top end of a site. So that's like your homepage, your about us, like what we do, maybe get involved, contact, things of that nature. And then there's the things that, that, that are below that. So how does this content, how do these pages tie together and where do they make the most logical sense um, not just from like a categorization and a reading standpoint, but from a browsing and using usable standpoint. So you might have different layers below that. So like under about us, you might have like 
mission and board of directors and, and impact. Uh, and then over time, if you have a, a strong site, arch if you plan the site architecture correctly from the beginning, as you build this out over time, this will scale with your organization. So if you add more, let's say impact and under impact, you might have like, uh, you know, your annual report. So you might have annual report 2022, 2021, and so on at, over time. And then from those annual reports over time, you might start pulling out key pieces of that, have that featured on, on a highlights page or something like that. So, so as you're building, as you're planning, uh, you know, constantly keep the site architecture in mind. Uh, we'll go through some, some best practices of site architecture and how those how those are, are used, and then you know see what, what might be the best fit for your organization. So the first one is this single level. Uh, this is probably the most basic. This is what you'd see and what we'd expect for a site that's kind of just starting out or more brochure driven, doesn't have a lot of like interaction and engagement expected on the site, and that's where you don't have you just have everything kind of listed across the top. Sometimes you'll see that down the side of the page um, or on the mobile menu. Where it's pretty basic pretty straightforward so you've got like you know about resources programs events blog and the expectation of a user at this is once they click one of those pages that's the last that's kind of the last step in that in that architecture that hierarchy so when they click about everything about that organization is expected to be there we don't want them to have to click there go to that page and then go somewhere else with this type of uh this type of navigation the next would be like a simple drop down. This is also, you know, common when you've got multiple pages and then that kind of higher who we talked about earlier. Um, what's important when you do the, when you have these drop downs, a few things. One, we want to make sure that the user, when they land on the page, they know right away that if I hover over this thing, so, there's going to be more there. And we can do that with little cues, like the little carrot you might see or that chevron next to these. That just um, show, tells the user, tells the visitor that that means if they hover over that or they click on that, there's going to be more there's more there or you might see a plus sign or or, or maybe different colors um, for that navigation that would just kind of let the user know what to expect this is this is a, a a great use case for when you do have you know something that you'd want to scale over time so if we could go back to the first one you saw about but as you grow maybe you switch from that single level to the multi-level a simple drop down where you've got some more pages under that about section and then the last, uh, you know, kind of common one is what we call like a mega menu, which is much more complex drop down. We really see this on on sites that have, you know, tons of of lower of inner pages, um, you know, a bunch of different related content, but they don't want to put it in like one really long drop down. Um, so you see this on sites like like think like Best Buy, right? So they might have like you know products, and then they have the different categories, and under those they've got like subcategories. Um, it's a great way to get someone there really quickly without having to take them multiple steps away. So in this example, we don't want someone to have to click on about us, see a drop down, have that say all these different things on it. Using this mega menu structure, uh, we can put a, we can put a lot there without having to drive them to multiple clicks away, and then they can get you know one to two clicks away from their their uh, where they're trying to go throughout the site. Once you talk, once you've gone through that site structure, now we want to talk about how user a user flows through that site structure. So this is the path they take uh, when to to get to that you know page, to the donation page, or to the uh, you know join membership or volunteer page or something like that. And this is outlining you know once you've created that structure, it's outlining the expected steps to get there, and then. Over time, we 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 uh, optimize the entire user experience to try to get them there faster. So back to that Amazon example, um, I know there was a, I've kind of read this case study on that before, where it talked about they wanted to get there. We want one click checkout. I want one click checkout, and the developers kept coming back, and they would have like, okay, I've got four steps, but we've really shortened this checkout process down. And they go back and they say, no, one click checkout, one click checkout. We got to get them there faster. So it's you know looking at that user flow, looking at what what's happening now, what the expectation is, the outcome expected was one click checkout. What they ended up with was something where it would store your information, so you don't have to edit, edit your credit card and and all that stuff every single time. You would check out, but they gave you the ability to go back and change something if you wanted to, instead of making you fill that stuff out over time. And they really optimized that user flow from someone seeing a product, checking out without having to take all those extra steps. Um, looking at that user flow, managing that user flow can help you identify like problems and, and help you reach your goals as you see like how people are actually using your site versus how you expected them to use their site. So come up, start all that with a plan. Uh, this is what that user flow might look like. So we like to do it through a, through diagramming. Uh, you can do it, you know, right on, if, depending on how, how complex your website is, this works great like on a whiteboard. 
Uh, but but having something like this with that set that you work with your team, you work with your uh, you know marketing agency on to really see all the pieces of this, you might not realize how many steps it is taking someone right now, or you might you know maybe oversimplifying what you think they're going to do. A common example I always see is uh, you know across websites, a lot of nonprofits or organizations put the big donate button in the top of the the uh, the top of the browser. And this is anecdotal, but from our experience with you know thousands of websites, that gets less than two percent of all website clicks. Um, and that's not because people don't use it. It's a really great way to you know reiterate the fact that like this organization accepts donations. But your user is probably going to your impact page and seeing what where the money goes and then donating, or they're reading a blog and then they're seeing a call to action in that blog and then donating. So thinking about that and the overall user flow is important too. So not just what you hope they do, but what the you know what the actual logical path is. Mapping that out and seeing how many steps there are, and then optimizing and, 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 and improving that over time. Once we've kind of optimized for for that that experience that user flow and that experience, we we start to talk about how we're going to design the site. And one of the key elements of the design is going to be the responsive web design. I'll kick it to Joe to, to take this over. Yeah, thanks, Kyle. Yeah, responsive web design. A, a, a good example is if you're ever you know trying to order uh, some Italian food online and you and you and you Google Stromboli's near me. And the menu, all these menus pop up and you got to grab your phone and you're trying to open it up and read it. That's a bad user experience. Um, and, and, but a lot of a lot of nonprofits and small businesses still have their website set up that way. And responsive web design is when a web design is built and a lot of, you know, Wix and, and Squarespace, WordPress, they have these features now built in, but it, you still need to design for them. So responsive web design it's, a, it's an approach where, depending on screen size, orientation of device being used, you'll be able to, to view it accurately within your browser, within your laptop, your tablet. If you have your phone, whether it's horizontal or vertical, it's going to adjust and be responsive to that type of format. So that's what you know, responsive web design is. The other piece of that is not just, you know, can, can you visibly read it? And, and not have to pinch and scroll, but is it loading fast enough and, and making sure all that works. If not, if you run your Google Analytics, you're gonna see very high bounce rates. That means people come to your site and, and bounce within seconds or it doesn't even load and, and, and they don't get there. So just to give you an example on the next slide, um, you know, really what we're talking about here mainly is, is mobile optimization. So like I said, we're talking about speed, the sizing of your graphics, the layout of all your content, the activity that you're trying to drive and the engagement. All this needs to be taken into consideration. You know, if you look at the, uh, the mobile phone with the X, that's kind of what I was talking about with, with the menu. So when you, when you do design, you know, hopefully you're using a WordPress, Wix or Squarespace, they have these tools built in but thinking through how all of this is going to load. You might have the best graphic designer in the world that they developed this beautiful brochure looking website and it's just one big you know, image or it's all these different images, but it might look beautiful on your laptop or a computer, but once you start squeezing and you know, really changing the size of that on a phone, it's, it's gonna stack and you have to really design for all that stacking. So here, help home healing, that's on the left. You got the photo on the right. That's what it looks like on your computer. But as you look on your phone, these things begin to layer on top of each other. So you have to design in, in that manner, knowing people are going to scroll down. And then the buttons as well, where are those buttons gonna pop up? Are they gonna cover a certain you know, important piece of information or a part of the photo that's critical or not, taking all these into consideration is, is really going to uh, improve your user experience. And then the next thing we look at is usability and accessibility. Um, you know, we do a lot of work for government sites as well, where we have to comply with the American Disabilities Act. So anything that we create has to fall within that range. And we'll share a, a URL so you can really look at the specifications to make sure your site is, um, is viewable and usable for, for folks who might be colorblind or have 
some type of physical, medical, uh, mental, or hardware uh, disability. So the goal here is focus on text clarity, really think through, you know, if you, if you go back to digital literacy, health literacy, financial literacy, whatever you're addressing, make sure that the content you're writing is, is even understandable at, at the right um, level there as well. Don't rely solely on color. Your colors have to be at certain gradients so they don't, you don't lose. If you have a dark text on a dark background a white text on a lighter background, that might be invisible to someone who, who has issues um, with, with recognizing and distinguishing color. So all these different pieces need to be taken into consideration. And the other thing you wanna do is test your web pages using only a keyboard. So you're not using your fingers and poking around on your screen, you're able to navigate on, on a keyboard. Um, add labels to fillable fields. So if you have a black field, a blank field, it is you know, almost in, in a light grayscale filled out so people know where, where, to, what, where and what to fill in into those fields, especially you know, if, they're, if they're becoming members or donors or volunteers help them uh, uh, along the way. And then the last piece really is, you know, making sure that your website is um, identifiable, identifiable but by the language uh, that, that your audience might, might be doing, might be, um, you know, speaking. And, you know, a lot of sites, you can put that Google translator at the top so it can switch between Spanish and English and, in other languages, but, but definitely take that into consideration as well. Which brings us to um, really implementing a UI and UX optimized design. So we'll go through some, some best practices now, give you some real, real life examples. One thing we have to look at is typography. And this is where the art and science of design comes in. You're really focusing on your messaging and then you're focusing on the way, you know, the human brain uh, digests information. So if you look at this, it's, 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 it's real, it's funny, and, and, and it's pretty accurate. Um, you, you know, your eyes start out on the left and then they move down and, and, and to the right in terms of messaging. Um, so you really want to get your, your main point, your bold right up front and center to the left and then the call to action on the, on the lower right. So that's where your call to action to donate, to, to, to volunteer, et cetera, comes into play. And what's interesting, once, once you see these you know, tips and tricks and, and the science behind it, it you know, it's great to look at ads, brochures, websites, and you'll start to really see some great practices, even on television when, when, when they're putting imagery up. So, Keep an eye out and, and you'll start to see some really great examples. Um, but some best practices, don't have too many different typefaces, you know, keep, keep that to a minimum and choose typefaces that complement and contrast uh, with one another. Just like you have different color palettes that, you know, the different colors within your brand guide all complement each other. Same with your fonts, you know, have your main font family use that family, maybe you have a second font that complements it, but, but make sure it does uh, actually complement it. And you can work with your, you know, your branding um, agency uh, to do something like that. And keep readability, legibility, and accessibility top of mind. And again, the, we get gets back to user experience, but this is where the visual hierarchy comes into play. So looking at an ad, looking at your homepage, looking at your donation page, Keep this hierarchy and typography uh, in mind when you're building all these different uh, elements. The next slide. Yeah, so I'll, I'll jump in with some examples. Of so um, great job covering that, Joe. So this, when you take a look at this, this is like a, a site we've done, one of the sites we've done where we, we I wish I had like a before picture of this, but just showing how, how um, that, that typography and that, that hierarchy is used. Um, so, First thing you see when this when you come to this page is obviously these great graphics. We'll we'll touch on imagery as well. Um, but you know, like the the main headline, "Welcome to Pineapple Land," and you might skip over that 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 piece below that. You often will just miss that that paragraph below that. But then you see the the next steps, the next actions we want you to take, and they really they, they're really drawn out from the page as well. So you either order now, uh, you know, or locate applyables. Um, 
and that, that's just just to kind of show how that would that would work. So we we structure the page accordingly. You also what, another thing you might see is how the how that text is aligned. So along with the topography is alignment. Um, everything's sort of center aligned, and even the buttons are center aligned below that. So that every, you know your your eyeball, your eye, your view, the way that you the browse this page is going to go sort of funnel down in that format as well. The next piece that we want to look at is color um, and using color. So just not from a usability standpoint as well, make sure contrasts are correct. You're not putting colors, you know, two colors over top of each other that make it hard to read or make it hard to engage the site. But color can also, uh, you know, really convey meaning. Um, there's a there's a, a, a number of great studies out there and research that's been done in the past of, of what different colors um, mean to, in different situations. So you often see in, in the medical space, you'll see like, light greens and light light blues and grays and, and colors like that that are used because uh, it's supposed to give you like a sort of a calming feel. And then in a lot of brands like, you know, kind of in your face brands like Monster Energy and Coca-Cola and Nike and things like that, you'll see much more vivid colors like reds and oranges and like the really bright greens get used because that's supposed to like elicit action, right? Or, or, or ask you to take an action. Um, so make sure, you know, make sure that the colors you, you choose and the colors you choose in your web design not only fit your brand, but also fit what you expect the user to, to, to do and the action you expect them to take. Um, they, they evoke moods. So the same thing like I was saying, like, you know, get, getting them into a calming place or getting them into um, a place where they they, they trust your brand is, is or your organization is very important. You know, if, we're, if, it, if it looks like, you know, if you're using like reds and blacks and dark colors and things like that, and you're asking them to donate, it actually, that, that those colors actually will change moods and, and, and make you less likely to, you know, you know, attribute money to a cause or, uh, you know, volunteer for the organization if it's not, you know, structured correctly uh, and making sure that they are also well aligned with your cultural association. So uh, your, you know, whether that, that's the, the, your local demographic, your local market or whatever the culture might be that, that you're, you know, trying to attract or providing source resources for. One thing that's important here, it says, you know, it also talks about personal preferences when choosing colors. It's, it's important to take yourself out of, out of this, out of the UX, out of the UI as, when you can, when it's your specific preference and think specifically about your audience and your brand's preferences. So yeah, you might like, you know, these colors, maybe like using teals and purples and greens together, but your audience is more likely to res respond or react to a different color palette. Uh, we want to keep that in mind and you want to be designing for your audience, designing for your user and not just your um, like your current audience, but what your expected audience is. So following that scalability approach as you grow, as you want to attract more people, what are they going to to engage with and what's going to, to work well for them? So uh, on these slides, you see some examples. So this is another, another one we did for uh, the city of Wilmington, Delaware, where we were trying to get people to, to take an action to, you know, get back out in the community. This is like before and then even, and then following COVID or during and following COVID, like get back out there. It's time to get back out there. It's time to, to be active in your community. It's time to live and work and play, uh, you know, and move to the city of Wilmington. You'll see these colors are sort of bright and vibrant and, and have that underlying connotation of that's what we expect the city to be now too. Get the slide. Yeah. Um, here's another example of, of using those colors in action. So for a site we, we work with, the death penalty focus, as I was talking about, like the, the blacks and the, the, the reds that really are kind of in your face, that's very relevant and specific for this organization. If you think about what the organization does, they spread awareness about, uh, you know, the death penalty, the unfairness of death penalty and, and legislation around that. Uh, and then we use other colors that really pop out on those backgrounds, like using, you know, white as the uh, the call to action there with the red the red text over it, so it draws attention right to that in that um, in that example, and then that black and white imagery kind of sets sets the mood for this being like a a sad but powerful uh, you know cause to, to to contribute towards, and in this this example kind of leads into the the next few the next the next piece of this in imagery as well using this imagery which is somewhat abstract, um, but also has call, calls you to action so like there's no justice no peace this is a very strong very powerful image and we're and you see we laid the, the call to action over that says become a volunteer so we could by becoming a volunteer the expectation is get justice get peace right or you know kind of contribute towards this this organization 
So as I was mentioning imagery, images and graphics, you know, you can use this all different ways. The one I just showed you as a background, as an abstract image, you can also use this for illustrations and like concepts like the ones you see on the right side of the screen where we actually have, uh, you know, we built, we designed this, this, uh, this shape, I guess, that, that fits within the brand and the logo of this, this company. And as you actually hover over each one of these, more information pops up about this. So it becomes like an interactive thing. And what you can see this does is it also helps enhance that brand identity. So we've connected the shape we use to the logo in their brand. It's not exactly the same, but you see it's got that same sort of the shape, the look and feel, the colors, and it really helps connect that to that brand. And now this same, um, the same imagery can also be used on billboards, can be used in print ads, it can be used in you know, social media posts, it can be used all across the digital landscape uh, and across your different collateral, and it'll connect them back to that brand. Uh, Additionally, using imagery helps you communicate data. So like you can you could uh, have a, a study that you've done or maybe the impact that you've had or show, um, you know, show growth or something like that over time. Using imagery to, to convey that is a lot better than just writing out a bunch of stats um, and, and writing out a bunch of, uh, you know, background data that no one's going to really read through. Uh, and then what it also ultimately does is it creates visual interest. So, you know, it draws your eye to that. Um, it can it can get you kind of like, oh, it starts to think of, of how you, how your organization is positioned, the type of audience your organization serves. If you use like those community type images or, uh, you know, we always, we, we know like through, from, from social media, and from engagement, like puppies and babies get, get tons of clicks, tons of action, but having those on your site, if it's relevant to your site, that's going to really, you know, create that visual interest and, and tie them back to your brand. So another example, another great example, I think I thought of, you know, using imagery in action is this one. This is an art organization uh, in, a, in a, a community, one of the websites that we helped them work on. And there's two pieces of this. Like if you go to the site, you'll actually see like this moving imagery in the background. There's like a video uh, that moves behind this, but also there's the static image as well that if you, you know, tie into that, you can see like what this organization is about, what this community is about uh, through the use of the image, the text in the image, and the text over the image. The, the text over the image tells you, you know, we're activating space to strengthen these communities. The text in the image is about the community, what they want the community to be about, like this vibrant life, family, emotion, hopeful, love, like all this positive. Uh, and that's the, that's the the what we want you to to feel, what they the audience, what the, the organization wants you to feel uh, when you come to that website. And then you'll see you also see there that call to action. It's not such a strong call to action. Just thank you for your support. So we've activated this space, this community. We've got this bright, vibrant space. Oh, you know, find out more about this, about how you can support, or find out how you supported us, or find out how others have supported us in the past. And then we roll that into iconography. Iconography is, is you probably see these all over the webs now, but all over the web now. But when you go to some, uh, a website, it's like got your different services, and every different service has a different icon. If you go to our site, we've got icons all over the place. Um, that, but they all tie into a different service or a different uh, solution that we might provide or a different uh, outcome for an organization. Uh, and this is a great way to like convey complex, uh, I'm going to read off the slide, concepts or actions clearly. So, you know, having in this example, there's like a, a, a picture of like a house with like a kind of a, a soft background behind it. And it talks about, you know, that, that, that specific part of what this organization does or that, that services organization does. Or if you look at the, uh, um, like there's an image of like a bank, right? And it's, it's all about foreclosure prevention. So it ties you to that. Like now you're thinking, okay, that's about money. This is about finance. This is about, uh, you know, uh, a, a positive a positive part of that too, using that color green, you know, green, green to use your list. It's like a positive, a positive emotion as well. Um, and then using these repeatedly throughout the site. So if you think about this, we put this on the homepage, we've got our five icons. If you go to a page about that, Throughout the site, if we continue to use that color and use that icon, now we can really tie that back together. So now you've created this user experience where your users are clicking on something, they're seeing that that green image of the bank, and now they know this is about foreclosure prevention. So all the blog posts could have that same color on it as well, have that same iconography. In your emails, you could subscribe have have users subscribe to um, email alerts about you know foreclosure prevention, and all those might have that same iconography across of it. And then you've started to kind of create these sort of sub brands um, with that. Here's an example of how we use this kind of a, a larger scale um, to for two on one Metro Chicago, where visitors come, users come here to find out about, you know, uh, community resources available for them. And we've got a strong icon tied to each one of these. 
And then they also, then as you go through the site, if you're to navigate through this site, you'll see the same thing that's carried throughout. So if you click on childcare, all the childcare results are going to pop up. You're going to have that icon in there for childcare, but you can see from the very beginning uh, what's, what's featured in, in, in that example. Uh, this also really ties your eye to that. So you might not come here first and see the, see that text. You might see that icon. Like, oh, that's healthcare. It's a heart in there. I know what this is about. Like, I know what to expect. And you, but it, it is very important when you are picking these that you are selective and you do understand, um, you know, what that is meant to be or what that can be used for. You don't want to be trying to push too hard and like say, oh, this is, this is healthcare. And it's got like, a, you know, a graph or something like that. That's not really as, as, as well tied to that. Uh, so this can certainly be your friend. It's very helpful on the web. It's very helpful to create visuals. It's very easy to, to, to tie things back together as you evolve that out over time. So I'll jump, we'll, after covering that, we'll kind of start covering our systems and methodologies and how we go about um, you know, optimizing user, user experience and working with organizations. Before we do that, I'm going to jump into a quick poll question and ask you, what's your biggest challenge now in updating your current website? Is it knowing where to start? So again, just drop these back in that chat. Um, is it not having a resource who can update the site? So you know, you either, you either spread too thin, or you you know you don't have someone on on staff that can do that. Um, maybe you don't have time to dedicate to, to this improvement, so you know what to do, but you don't have the time to do it. Um, or your website doesn't allow you to do it without breaking it. So it's outdated. It hasn't been kept up to speed. It's using an old technology. It's not responsive. Um, I saw someone just said A, B, and C. Uh, that's probably pretty common to see see more than one example. Uh, so I'll give you guys all a second because you guys look like you're pretty active on it now. And then I'll kick it back over to Joe to talk to talk you guys through growth driven design. Great. Thanks, Kyle. Um, yeah, everyone, you know, it seems super common that, you know, a and, a and C are, are, are the most common. Um, and really to address that, it comes down to where to start. Uh, you know, if you do have limited resources and do have limited um, bandwidth and finances, uh, what, what's the best way to build a site that's continually to, to grow? And, you know, if, if you put your entire investment into a website, it might take, you know, six months to get done and you're missing out on a huge opportunity and you're really making a risky investment because you're not testing um, you know, your, your assumptions on what's going to work. So we, we use a growth driven approach when we're creating websites. Um, so that way your website is in a constant state of improvement and you're always improving the messaging, the design, you're measuring, you're seeing where people are going when they you know, depending on what type of site architecture you're using or, you know, how is what the typography, the colors, the iconography, looking at all these, A, B testing them along the way. So your site is in constant flux, but in a good way because it's, it, it's improving and you have the financing, you have, you have more financial liberty and, you know, more time to, to do all that and make those improvements. So on the next slide, it's kind of a schematic of what, what we're suggesting here. So like I was saying, if, if you build a website and let's say it's a $20,000 website and it's going to take six months to a year to build. And once it's launched, you, you know, you, you're, you're making assumptions that people are going to follow a certain flow. They're going to respond to certain colors and you've just spent your entire budget and now you're just crossing your fingers, this thing is going to, to work. Um, and, we, and we've seen a lot of nonprofits go down that road, businesses, government sites, it's, it's, it's not the best approach. So what, what's really taking over now is, is this new approach where it's, it's an agile process. So you come up with the strategy of, and really look at your goals and the ROI, what, what you wanna do with your nonprofit, and you launch a Launchpad website. What that means is it's a website that is addressing all your must-haves and all your need-to-haves and assumptive-to-haves. Um, that's the other 20%. And, and that's where we'll A, B, and test stuff. So we'll launch the site and we'll learn from it and we'll see how people are clicking through. And then we'll transfer that knowledge back to the team and say, okay, listen, let's let's not put all the effort into the blog. People are really responding to these webinars. 
by these live events that we're posting on the site. Let's let's drag people there and, and put our energies there. So that way your site is, you know, every month, every quarter, you, you have your new plan, you have your assumptions, uh, 20,000, even with the $2,000 website, it, it, regardless of your investment, it, it really comes down to not putting all the money in, in at one time. It's putting a fraction of that and saving your funds aside to, to continue to improve it. And, and, and you'll see improvements, you know, at, at the end of the year, two years, as, as all these improvements compound, your, your donations are gonna be compounding accordingly, your, your membership, your followers, um, and, and your subscribers. So that's kind of the approach we take. And if you really go back and look at everything we talked today, it's impossible to, to really guess everything's going to work. The user flows, the design, the typography, the colors, what, what framework do we use? We're going to put in place best practices. And we know from a percentage standpoint, what's going to work best. But at the end of the day, it's always, it's always better to continually in, in, improve along the way. So that, that takes us to kind of the end of the, the presentation. We just want to share with you some, some really great tools that you can use to, to get started. Uh, like Aretha said, we'll send out the, the deck as well in the recording. But if you go to TechSoup's website, um, there's a website wellness report. And if you click on that link, it'll take you there. You just simply enter in your, uh, your URL. It will scan your website, tell you, you know, cover a lot of things we talked about today, give you a quick report on page speed and, and usability and, and some SEO uh, feedback. And then what you can do from there is it'll actually give you best practices to improve all those. So uh, that's the website wellness report. It's on TechSoup. I think David just put a link into the chat as well, and, and you can access that there. Next slide, website development. So like, like we said, we, we build TAP Network in partnership with TechSoup over two, 300 websites a year and, and support close to a thousand of them. So if you go to TechSoup's website, click on services in the drop down menu, going back to site architecture, uh, you'll see website services and digital marketing. That's TAP Network, click on website services and you'll see a full suite of uh, services, the website wellness report tools, a lot of great blogs and resources um, right there to, to, to get started. And we'll just go cover one or two of them right now, just to give you an idea of, of how we can support your efforts. Um, on the next slide. Oh, I did, I clicked backwards and I locked the screen out. <laughs> you to do it. There we go. So we have, Couple different services. If you for for some of our clients, if you want a growth driven custom website development, that starts at ten thousand dollars. We also have programs and retainers for nonprofits um, who are seeking you know support. So if you already have a website and you need ongoing support, like many of you said, um, you know you don't have the bandwidth, the time, and in, in some cases the expertise to do all these. If you go to the next slide. Um, give you an example of what we do. So for custom website development, it, it, it's kind of everything we talked about today, the strategy, the content design, the wireframing, understanding the goals, the growth driven approach to development, and then launch and testing and continual improvement. So this is just a quick outline of what we'll do, or you know, if you're working with any developers, um, the, the services to look out for for custom website development. And then on the next slide, um, website maintenance services. So like I was saying, this gives you your, you know, your part-time chief marketing officer, chief technology officer, CTO. You have a team of folks that are there um, every month with a set amount of hours to support your website. So if you're, if you're, if you're on Wix and you want to go to WordPress or Squarespace and now you want to you know, move up to WordPress. So you have a WordPress site and you want to move to HubSpot and marketing automation or just make changes and add donation platforms and, and things like that nature. Um, 
that's that's what this service is starting at uh, $499 a month and it scales up accordingly it just depends on on how many hours you may need and again if you're just getting started with your website and you go to website development page on TechSoup there's a ton of uh, free resources and content to get started or you could just book a free consultation and we can walk through uh, your specific um, scenario and needs. So that about wraps up our, uh, our show. And if you guys have any questions or if there's some questions in the chat box, we can um, do our um, tech suit Jeopardy here and, and answer as many questions as possible. So um, yeah, let's see uh, what we have um, in store here. Yeah, so John um, asked, will there be someone that can contact me? He had his email. I think it's probably best for him to contact you all, right? Or somebody can grab his email and contact him. Yeah, so that that so we'll share this uh, this presentation afterwards. It's got the links that we kind of talked about today. It's got the link right to our, our, our landing page. And if you just fill that out, just some quick information, someone on our team will get, will get in touch with you. Awesome. So um, Andy asks, do you have any suggestions for brand font that you didn't mention. You meant you mentioned a lot of different brand fonts. Uh, yes, I, I saw that one. It said, uh, "Can you is it, what do you do if your brand font's not available?" So I'm not. Uh, I'm, if you can add some context to that, maybe and uh, in the chat, that would be helpful. But if you're if you're saying that like you, you, don't, you guys don't have access to it anymore because maybe your your uh, your developer's not available or something like that. Um, if it's on the website, if it's on a website, we can we can probably take a look at it and see like what it is and help you help point in the right direction of, of that font. Um, but a lot of times we just recommend, you know, starting from the basics and and using one using Google's fonts. They're free. Uh, they work. They're supported across the web. Uh, there's like 1500 or something like that of them out there. And there's a lot of like common like fonts that can be used that that might that you might see somewhere else. Uh, and, and just make sure that 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 you know it works with your brand, works with your colors, works with with your styling, uh, and don't don't overcomplicate it. Okay, this is a great question from Mark. He said, "How can we post a free item of interest or value, like a PDF that has information on it, um, for our visitors to download, where they can put in their name, email, and phone number, and automatically gets into an email CRM such as Mailchimp or Constant Contact." Yeah, that's a good, that's a great question. So, um, I mean, if depending on how your site's set up, like if it's on WordPress, uh, we would we usually use either Contact Form Seven or Gravity Forms, uh, which allows you to kind of keep a database in the back end of those submissions, and then you just have to tie that into either an automation of some sort. So, to your point, like Mailchimp um, or the CRM you have in place, which will say, okay, this you know this person filled this information out. We can set up an automation uh, to look for anybody new in that list, and then when someone's in that list, we have an automation that goes out and says. Hey, thank you for your interest. Um, click here to download your, your guide. Automation is so great. So A. Robinson said, what colors would you say are the easiest on the eyes for people that are colorblind? Uh, so that's a good question. So um, I, I'll, I'll share a link to a couple links for this. It, it's, colorblindness isn't, isn't always as much about the, just the colors, but it's also what you do with those colors. So like having contrasting colors um, like that are used together or used to, to, uh, to showcase like an action or what you some, want someone to do. So like common, common example would be like uh, on websites or, or on applications you use where like on is green and off is red. If someone's colorblind, they can't tell if it's on or off. So using an icon on top of that to show like on or off or like words over top of that show on or off help you kind of navigate around that. Um, and then colorblindness is, is often specific to different users so different people can see things. Maybe they can see shades, but they don't know, you know, deeper, deeper or light. They might be able to see um, color over certain things. So it's really specific kind of to the user, but I can share some best practices um, on, these, on these slides as well. Mm. And David said, how do you test and measure the user experience? Like what tools do you use? Uh, yeah, that's great. So the easiest tool to use, it's free, is, is Google Analytics um, to track like how people use your site. So user flow, what they're clicking on to understand like their, their, how they're navigating through the site. Um, we use tools like Hotjar, which allow you to do heat mapping and smart look. Um, 
smart smart look or smarter look which also which kind of take that a, a step deeper to see how someone's using the site and then there's just some practice some practices you can use so like um as joe was talking about the accessibility checker to see how your your site rates in there ranks in there um looking at your looking at your website in grayscale so like using the browser tools to like look at it in grayscale is helpful if you're trying to see how how it would, would appear to someone who is colorblind to check for you know user experience usability from that that as well okay and john alvarado i see you you put your phone number in here you are very very serious so i hope you see the contact information from joe awesome okay um there's a question in the q a for e-commerce sites driving big metadata what are the best ways to avoid the site being hacked or tampered with by third parties uh, that's i mean that, that's a Secure more security question that all kind of depends like what the where the site's hosted so making sure you have a secure host a host that is that can manage that for you uh, and then locks those files down locks those those services down making sure you have like a a, a full SSL in place so that that, ha that has end to end encryption um, so nobody can kind of like hijack that uh, and then you know keeping keeping every keeping your your plugins tools scripts things like that up to date. Uh, so that you know when something's exploited that hacker doesn't get access to it rc says if our volunteer doesn't have time would you be able to help with our website and how much it costs and such yeah that's a great question so i'm um, happy to help um we work with thousands of nonprofit organizations um joe i think joe mentioned and said on these slides there's a there's a link there to, to kind of jump in either have a conversation with us get started one of the first thing we always want to do is just have like a quick consult to see like what you actually need and what your goals are. If you, I mean, a lot of times we'll see nonprofits that have like a list of here's all my nice to haves and need to have. So if you don't have something like that, help putting something like that together is, is also very helpful for those conversations. And then we can wrap you the pricing around that. We price things out all different ways. Like we can either have just a monthly retainer where you know you've always got access to it, you have access to our entire team. We've got everything from senior designers, creative directors, senior developers, software architects, all the way down towards just you know people that can do data entry and content. Uh, we kind of blend that stuff all together so you have access to a full team uh, depending on what you need at what time and then we also just do you know kind of per project or, or per engagement pricing as well nice so that's the end no more questions here um want to give you kyle or joe the final words for anyone um, i did see one more question i see oh i see a couple questions in here i think but um in the in the chat actually i'll answer real quick um well, Lily's asked a couple of questions, I think she's asked, they've asked if um, where they can find website templates like outlines on how to structure our website for nonprofit organizations. We actually have, um, I don't think it's published yet. We actually have like a best practices presentation for structuring uh, a homepage design, which which is like a tell, helps you tell the brand, tells you, tells your story about your organization, how to tell that story and then how to structure that site. Um, so if you reach out to that us, we can help. We can share that with you. And then I also noticed that there's um, a question on are there discounts for nonprofits? So yeah. So partnering with TechSoup, we actually we we are, we discount all of our services um, twenty percent across the board for nonprofit organizations going directly through TechSoup. Um, so if you follow those links, you'll you'll get a different price, different uh, different engagement than you would if we were kind of go, go direct. Awesome. That sounds like it's it. Uh, this has been a great, you know, great questions from you all. As I said, you know, we'll share this. We'll, this will be out to you guys in the next uh, 44, 48 hours. Uh, and then we'll have um, we'll make sure we include, you know, those, those links either in the email or and or in the, the presentation um, so you guys can get directly in touch with us. Bye, everybody. Thank you, everyone.